Akron Zoo Lunch and Learn. My name is Lauren. I am the lead keeper here of the Hoofstock and Primate team. And we are outside of our must-deer exhibit. So we have two must-deer in here. Right now you can see Anastasia. She is our female must-deer. She is four years old and they both weigh about 27 pounds. So they, a lot of that is what, what you see is just fluff. Um, Vlad is kind of right now on the other side of the exhibit, so hopefully he will come over soon. But um, we also have geese in, in this exhibit. They are currently off exhibit um, due to, you can see we have straw everywhere. We are attempting to grow some grass in here. And we have been trying to do this for years, um, but the geese eat all the seed. So since we are not open, um, we have them in a side yard that um, is right behind that fence over there and they have access to the barn. So we can try and grow some grass and hopefully this exhibit will be beautiful by the time you guys come back. So you can see Anastasia, she's also grazing on the grass. Um, they're found in Northeast Asia in the forest regions and they would, you know, climb up rocky areas. So that's kind of why we have these two rock hills in this yard to try and mimic that. Um, if you ever kind of look at their hooves, um, they might be split a little bit wider than most deer species and that kind of gives them the ability to climb on those rocks really, really well. They also have very good jumping abilities, so it is actually quite impressive. Um, they're kind of like the parkouring deer species, I call them. And one of the first things that a lot of people notice about them is their faces, right? They, they look a lot like kangaroos, um, and that is kind of fitting because they do jump very, very well. Um, so we do have some browse down here for her. She was eating it, of course, right before we went live. Um, but in the wild, they would actually eat uh, lichen and bark and pine uh, pine needles. So we can't really recreate that exactly here at the zoo, right? Um, but we do our best with providing them browse. They get alfalfa, which is a form of hay um, that has a lot of uh, protein in it. And then for their main diet, we give them root vegetables and two different types of pellets that would be um, nutritionally what they would need in, the, in, in their native habitat. Um, she does probably prefer the root vegetables the most, I would say. And then we do give them um, fruits and vegetables as a sort of training treat. So these guys are very standoffish, right? Um, very timid. Uh, we've had them here at the zoo for a couple of years now. And um, we've been working a lot recently on figuring out kind of what their favorite foods are, foods are and using that to our advantage to um, you know, maybe one day work on some training with them. So if you look over here along the, along the wall, we have um, a board down with a PVC cap, that white cap in front of it. And we've been feeding them their fruits and vegetables inside of it every night to try and train them to go up on that board with the hopes that eventually, once they're going on that board well, we could put a scale underneath of it and they are used to that board. It would be on top of the scale, so it wouldn't be something scary, it wouldn't be something new and we would be able to stand outside that exhibit because they seem to be um, less nervous when there's sort of a barrier between us and them. So we can approach them from the exhibit fence very well and they don't run away from us. Whereas when we're in the exhibit, that's kind of a different story. So we'd be able to slip the scale underneath of that, have the um, indicator outside of the exhibit and get a weight on them. Right now, um, all of the weights that we are getting on them are during their exams, so once a year, all of our animals here at the Akron Zoo get a yearly exam and you know we do routine blood work, we get weights, the vets check them out, make sure there's no issues with their teeth, with their hooves, all of those kinds of things that we can't see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so you might also notice that uh, um, Anastasia has a couple missing patches of fur. So she kind of goes through this shedding cycle um, in the springtime after winter is over and they kind of, she kind of loses all of her, her fur. Our male Vlad doesn't really do that. Um, for some reason, she, this is what she does. Um, but we just keep an eye on it, make sure we don't see her itching at it, licking at it, that the skin looks good, um, all of those types of things. So you can see she's about to go into the barn. Um, we've been feeding them inside the barn because actually in the month of May is when she typically has um, her fawn. So, They've been at the Akron Zoo here for a couple years. Um, the past two Mays, she has successfully had fawns here, and um, usually they, she has them out on exhibit. 
which is not convenient. Um, and so we have to bring her and the baby inside because um, we do separate her from Vlad um, the entire time that, that the fawn is here with us. So we've been feeding her inside the barns, um, hoping that she will go in there on her own and um, choose to have her fawn in there, hopefully, if it happens um, when we are not here. Sorry, I didn't turn my cell phone off. Um, so, like I said, she's had two fawns. Um, their names were uh, Alana and uh, Little Bucky. They both went to other zoos. So, Alana went, she was the first fawn that she had um, two years ago. She went to the San Diego Zoo, and Little Bucky went to the Dakota Zoo, um, actually with another fawn from, from the Columbus Zoo to form a breeding pair there. So, I was trying to look on our... Um, our database that we use to kind of keep animal records and I believe there's only 13 Siberian Mustir um, in AZA zoos so that is um, you know pretty rare I think when you walk past this exhibit they are likely not doing very much when you walk by but getting to see this species is very rare in a zoo they do have them at the Columbus Zoo but um, other than them you know that's this is probably the only place that you're going to see the species they're a very cold weather tolerant species, so it's a good hoofstock for us to have here, right? Because um, it's what, May and it's 42 degrees, and they love that. Um, so you will see them out here in the dead of winter, no problem at all. Um, we have temperature ranges for all of our species, and we do not lock these guys inside unless it's um, below zero. So they are very, very cold tolerant. It's a good species to have here. Um, I also believe there's only two breeding pairs of the species in AZA zoos. So we are kind of one of the leaders in breeding Siberian mustier, which is really, really amazing. Um, again, like I was saying, she usually has her fawns in May. So there is the potential that she is currently pregnant. Um, we are very hands off with them. They um, can get very stressed out if you try to, try to do any veterinary procedures or anything like that. Um, our, you know, our snow leopard, right? She's trained to have an, uh, an ultrasound so we can monitor her pregnancy. She's trained to do those types of things. These guys aren't. Um, so we just kind of keep an eye on her behavior, keep an eye on, you know, is she eating more? Is she go starting to go into the barn? Um, we note whenever we see them physically breeding, which they do, they have no care in the world. They'll do it while we're open, um, which is good, right? Um, so those are the kinds of things we monitor on her and we're very, we're very hands off. Um, you know, I would say it's kind of difficult to see if her stomach is getting bigger because they are so, so fluffy. Um, so we can't see, can't see those types of things that we might be able to see in a hoofstock species that, um, you know, is a little less furry. And they do have a six month gestation period. So kind of when we first see them breeding, kind of count six months. And then every day we come out on exhibit when we open in the morning, and throughout the day, just kind of keep an eye on that to see if, you know, we'll come in one day and they'll hopefully be a fawn. Um, and she's been a very, very good mother. And, you know, we're hoping that this may will be no different. Are there any questions then? We don't have any. No questions? Okay. Do you want to walk down and see Vlad? Sure. Okay. So, Mr. Vlad tends to be, um, the more, more standoffish of the pair, um, Anastasia will actually kind of come up to us. Um, yesterday she came into the barn and ate in front of me and I was probably within five feet of her. So, you know, that's progress for us. Maybe not, it doesn't sound like progress, but it is. Um, Vlad is kind of a different story. He, you know, runs away from you whenever you kind of approach him. Um, and I don't know if Vince, if you can get a good, good uh, video of him or not, but the cool thing about um, the family of mustier that Siberian mustier are in is that the males actually grow um, fangs instead of horns. So, right, other deer species are going to grow antlers. He grows fangs. And um, I believe they start developing when the males are about a one year of age. And they kind of continue to grow their entire life, which is really weird, right? Um, they can get to about like 10 centimeters long. And it is kind of a, a dominant display. Um, males out in their native habitat may fight, fight with each other during breeding season. Um, and the females tend to choose the males who have those longer, stronger 
um, fangs to breed with because they believe that their babies are going to be healthier. Felicia is asking, what do they like to eat? Um, so, you know, I've seen these guys, um, they're currently grazing on our new grass, so hopefully they don't eat it all. Um, and they seem to like their root vegetables, so we feed them, you know, beets, yams, um, turnips, those types of things. Uh, Anastasia was just um, chowing down on some willow brows, which is actually the first brows that I've seen her eat that I've given her, so that's also exciting. Um, and they do eat their fruits and vegetables that we use for their training. Um, Elizabeth wants to know how they get named. Oh, that's a good question. So, um, Vlad and Anastasia actually came to us. Um, Vlad came uh, from the San Diego Zoo, and then Anastasia came from the Bronx Zoo, and so they came with that name. Um, so I'm not sure how those zoos did it. But for us, um, whenever we have a fawn born, you know, our first one, we actually did have a naming contest for, for Alana. You could submit a name and um, we voted on it and everything like that. And then for the second fawn, um, they actually let the keepers name Little Bucky. And so he was named after our um, male Sika deer who used to live in this habitat that passed away. So that was kind of special for the keepers to get to name him. Um, but every zoo kind of does it differently. You know, some people let let the public vote on it. Some people let the keepers do it. Um, you know, so I don't know if she were to have a fawn this May, what we're going to do, but um, typically, you know, like with the snow leopard cubs, we usually have some sort of naming contest. Sure do. Um, so the other thing about these guys is they tend to be most active um, at dawn and dusk. So if you come here midday and they're just kind of laying around, you know, that's, that's typical for this species. That's why you see them acting like that. Um, so back to their to, to the training and and the veterinary aspect for these guys. So like I was saying, we you know try to be hands off with um, hoofstock species in general. Um, I'll walk past back this way, Vince. Um, so we try to be hands off with hoofstock species because in, under anesthesia, it's actually very dangerous for hoofstock. They usually don't handle it very well. So we try to do everything that we can while they're awake and be hands off as much as possible. So, like I was saying, they do get their yearly exam. We do obviously keep an eye on their behavior. We monitor them throughout the year. Um, but when we um, grab these guys, you know, we're not, we're not putting them in a kennel, right? They're very, very good at jumping. That would be dangerous for them. Um, we are grabbing them up and having, having people hold them safely so that it's safe for us and it's safe for them. And, um, you know, Vlad with his long sharp fangs they are very sharp um, we do wear you know long um, leather gloves to protect ourselves from him and you know it's very stress-free for, for us and for them as stress-free as it can be right but it is important to still do those yearly checkups and our vets are extremely fast I have a couple questions for you. Um, compared to common deer here in America are they similar or different or a little bit of both? Um, I would say probably a little bit of both you know they're they're definitely different in appearance. Um, they have a much thicker coat. So, you know, as you can see with her shedding, and then when we do have to catch them for exam, they shed their coat as kind of um, like a response to being caught like that. And it is impressive how much fur can come off in a second. And then you let them go and you don't even notice that they let anything off. Um, so they have that very thick fur. Their hooves are different for their rocky environment. Um, you know, obviously their faces are different. They, they look like kangaroos and Vlad has those fangs, um, which is, you know, very different for this species. It's kind of what separates them from other deer is that the males grow fangs and not, um, not antlers like other deer species. Lexi would like to know how old they are when they get their fangs. You might've said that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so typically they start growing at about a year old. Um, little Bucky, their fawn that they had last year, so he was a male. Um, he went to the Dakota Zoo before um, we got to see those fangs developing, which would have been really cute to see little fangs, right? Um, but yeah, it's typically around a year old. Felicia's asking, what are the fangs used for? So um, it's kind of a, a territorial, territorial thing, a dominant thing for the males. They may um, fight with each other in, during breeding season in their native habitats. And then it's also, you know, kind of a, a display for the females. So they might choose a, to mate with some, you know, some male that has a longer, um, stronger, uh, 
fang because, you know, in, in the animal kingdom that might mean that, that their bond with that male would be healthier. Dominic's asking, do you ever give their coats to other animals as enrichment? Um, we have not. We, um, the species that we do do that with is our alpacas. So they get um, sheared at least once a year, and we will save that fur and give it to certain species that might like that smell, right? Um, so our Komodo dragons would be a good example of they really, really like to roll around in that alpaca fur. But because um, these kinds kind of shed everywhere, don't really have the ability to collect their fur, but that would be really cool if we could. Denise is asking if they live in the wild, would they live in groups or packs? Um, so they tend to be solitary or live with like one or two individuals. So that is why, um, you know, when Anastasia does have her fawn, we separate them from Vlad. And usually Vlad remains out here in our main habitat and the fawn and Anastasia are in the barn for first couple months of the of the pond's life just so that we can monitor them more closely. And then once the pond's a little bit older, we switch them and Vlad goes inside and Anastasia and the pond come out. All right, well, we would like to thank you guys for joining us here for another Lunch and Learn. I hope when you guys come back here, you get a good look at Anastasia and Vlad and you know, maybe we will have a pond out here in a few months. And we hope to see you guys again next week. Thank you.